Uh, all right, here we go. It's time to review Diablo 4. So I want to get a couple of key things out of the way before we jump into things. Number one, what I played was a full review build, which means it included the entire game, everything content-wise that you can expect to see at release, minus any likely day one patches, and minus the cash shop, which I will get to, don't worry. Number two, I leveled up as a sorcerer playing through the entire campaign. I progressed into end game and spent about half of my total playtime checking out those systems, which include the nightmare dungeons, hell tides, whispers, fields of hatred, world bosses, and the capstone dungeons. Dungeons. And number three, we only had nine days to play, after which they shut down the servers and deleted everything. So for that reason, uh, no, I didn't max out my character because that will take hundreds of hours. But I did go through all of the paces. I was grinding for gear, bouncing between every activity, and progressing the Paragon board while continuously taking on harder challenges. So I saw what the end game consists of and got a good feel for the gameplay loop, or basically what it is we'll be doing on a regular basis. So between this review build, the various beta test and previews from last year, I've played over 100 hours of Diablo 4 at this point, and 100 hours is a good chunk of time, but also for any ARPG, loot game, or MMO, it's closer to zero hours than the total number of hours people tend to spend with these kind of games. The point of which is to say, just like any other live service game, just like with an MMO, I can't really with full confidence tell you exactly how Diablo 4 is going to feel 3, 6, or 12 months down the road, because we're not there yet, and a lot of that is going to hinge on the quality of their regular quarterly updates or their seasons. But I do have an idea of how much time I am likely to spend with the base game, judging off of the amount of content that's here at release, the level of difficulty, and the progression systems currently in place. And how much time is that? Well, Let's talk a bit about the game first. So I'm not gonna bore you with all the basics. This is an ARPG, it's a Diablo game. You likely know what to expect and how it starts. We pick from one of five classes, the Necro, Barb, Sork, Druid, and Rogue. Then there's a bit of character customization. Then you select your mode, normal or hardcore. And finally you pick the difficulty, which in most cases, my advice will be to start with World Tier 1, unless you begin two shotting packs of elites, or if you just wanna bump up the difficulty for the fun of the added challenge. Lastly, you name your character and off you go. Now, I'm assuming most of you watching this probably played at least some of the open beta, in which case you have a pretty clear grasp on how the campaign is structured and how things work in the open world. But if not, though, I'll give you a little rundown. So you get the main story quest. This is going to take you on a guided path through the entire game. Uh, we start out in the snowy region known as Fractured Peaks, and then after a short prologue, you will arrive at the main town of Kiovashad. Here you're going to find the game's major vendors, quest givers, various crafting and upgrade systems. Once you arrive to Kiovashad, the main story quest actually branches out, giving you three different choices. And this is what Blizzard was referring to when they said that Diablo 4 had a non-linear campaign. Although do keep in mind, you have to eventually do all of the main story quest in every zone. So even if you choose to skip past Fractured Peaks to start, you will eventually have to come back anyway. Fact is, in most cases, it's probably just best to stay in Fractured Peaks than run by foot all the way to the other zones. Really the only reason I would see to leave Fractured Peaks after the the prologue. If A, you have class mechanic quests that are over there and you want to go get those because yes, they provide a pretty big boost to power. Or B, if there's some like dungeon legendary aspect that you really, really want for your build early on and you can't wait. Otherwise, yes, it's probably best to just stick to Fracture Peaks, play through those campaign missions, and then move on once you finish them. So as you're doing the main story quest, which will have you following through the narrative of the game from one beat to the next, you're also just moving through the open world. And this hands down is one of my favorite aspects of Diablo 4. It's got a massive open world map with zero loading screens as you move between zones, and you'll explore various biomes, checking out different points of interest with a bunch of different things to do. There are five distinct regions in the game, each of which have their own theming based off of some real ro world locations with unique monsters and activities. And this is actually something that I don't want to spoil to you. Uh, like, I'm not going to give you a lot of the specifics of the interesting stuff I see in the, in the open world, mainly because the exploration and discovery of everything while playing here was a big chunk of what I enjoyed. The game world, first of all, is huge. And I mean, it's absolutely massive. I didn't even clear every single area of the map after a full week of playing the game. It's just very, very large, tons of space, and there's a large variety of things to see. As for things to do, well, it is an open world game, and if you played Fractured Peaks, you know pretty much everything. The, just the variety is mixed up a bit. Besides the overworld being full of various types of monsters to smash, it's also consisting of dungeons, events, strongholds, side quests, and collectibles. So you get all this stuff out in the open world to 
discover and engage with, uh, which you will come across just naturally as you play through the campaign and as it takes you through each of the zones, guiding you from one region to the next. Oh, and also the mounts. These are unlocked via a side quest when you get about halfway through, uh, somewhere around level 35 or 40, I think is when we got it. And when you get the mount, it is a massive help, really, especially since the game and the world is so big. They've got like a basic gallop speed, but also a dash, which will boost your movement temporarily. It's got three charges that just constantly refill with time. And every class also has a unique dismount attack. So yeah, the game is really big. There's a lot of activities and there's plenty of stuff to keep you busy. But remember the main thing, if you wanna progress into end game, is simply finishing the story. So playing through the entire campaign took me around 11 hours and I was level 43 when turning in the final quest. But please bear in mind, I was playing at a fairly quick pace, but not as fast as possible. Given I knew that the review window was limited and I only had so much time to play, I was just mostly interested in getting to end game quickly just for the sake of seeing it and learning about it and checking out the different systems. So that said, between the campaign and exploration of this huge open world with all the stuff we talked about, I could see it taking many more hours to complete. Like I could easily see people spending 30, 40, or even 50 hours just doing open world stuff in addition as they're moving throughout the campaign. That is certainly possible. But on the flip side, I could also see people finishing the campaign in way fewer than 11 hours because I wasn't exactly beelining it. I did spend some time doing some side stuff, doing some dungeons, exploration, public events, things like that. So how long it takes you to go through the campaign is totally just going to depend on your play style because the campaign is weaved into the open world. And as we touched on, there is a lot to the open world. I mean, honestly, you could play for 100 plus hours before you finish the campaign if you're just also doing all the open world stuff as you move throughout. But once you finish the campaign, it's time for end game. And this is where, as ARPG and MMO players would say, this is where the real game begins, right? So the first system that you're introduced to is the Tree of Whispers. On its face, it's pretty straightforward. Th these are rotating objectives that pop up all over the world, spread out between the different zones. So each task that you have will be worth a set number of favors. Once you collect 10 favors, you return to the tree and you collect a reward. Now, when I first heard about this system, I kind of wrote it off because I basically assumed it was just like any side quest, uh, daily quest system or the bounty system from Diablo 3, right? And yes, in a lot of ways it is, is, but also, as I was playing, I found myself really enjoying the fact that this system pushed me to revisit old areas, but then also brought me to explore new ones that I hadn't yet seen. And these objectives are also always in these clusters. It essentially takes a few areas within each zone and will give you a grouping of activities in one particular space. So these activities will include completing a dungeon, clearing a cellar, killing a variety of enemies in the area, turning in these collectibles, and then finishing one of those open world events that we discussed. So while the exact activities are constantly changing, their locations and which ones are available are rotating on a regular basis, and there will be multiple clusters up at any given time, the general structure of each grouping of the Tree of Whisper quest is what I just listed. And the harder objectives also reward more favors. So for example, if you clear a cellar, it's worth one favor, but if you do a dungeon, it's worth five, and you just have to reach 10 before you can go collect your reward from the tree. And this was a great way to to fill up low level pieces. It was a great way to level up and get experience. It was a great way to see more of the world. Overall, even though it is just like a daily quest system, just like a bounty system, because the world is so big and because I hadn't ever seen all of it and because it was a good source of experience and a good source of filling up low level loot pieces, I really liked engaging with it and constantly going out into the world, doing this cluster of activities, going back to the tree, getting experience, getting loot, then going out to another spot and just continuously doing this over and over again. So the Tree of Whispers is the first and only end game activity that you can do immediately after clearing the campaign. The rest of it is actually locked behind World Tier 3, which in order to progress to, you have to clear the Capstone Dungeon. So the Capstone Dungeon is this set level activity that basically acts as a barrier to you progressing World Tiers. Enemies inside have a hard locked level, which if you are too far below, is going to be really difficult. So when I finished the campaign, as mentioned, I was level 43. The Capstone Dungeon to go from World Tier 2 to 3 is set to level 50. Now I tried immediately going in, but I just wasn't doing enough damage and enemies would kill me too quickly 
quickly. So I spent a few hours doing those Tree of Whisper quests, uh, leveling up, gearing up, and then once I got to level 50, I jumped back into the capstone. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I think this thing has been a bit oversold in the past as being some massive challenge. In reality, it's just like a slightly longer than normal dungeon run. I mean, there are some cool enemies inside that you fight, but for the most part, it is really straightforward and it just acts as like a level or a gear check. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was like somewhat difficult at times, but there really weren't any interesting surprises or real new mechanics that I noticed compared to any other dungeon run in the game. Um, just kind of some like tough grouping of enemies at times. Although the boss fight was really cool, uh, like a lot of the other boss fights in Diablo 4. I really enjoyed it. I'll definitely give them that. Speaking of which, I know I haven't really discussed boss fights thus far. For one, we're not going to be revealing them for spoiler's sake, like the names of the campaign bosses. But I will tell you this much, the big ones that are in the campaign, as well as the boss in the capstone dungeon, I thought they were pretty good, really interesting, both in the boss design and mechanic design departments. I just thought uh, many of these were interesting, cool encounters that I really liked. Okay, so once you finish the world tier two capstone dungeon, you then unlock access to world tier three. And with that, you gain access to the rest of the end game. And that is including the nightmare dungeons and hell tides, as well as when you're introduced to the champion monsters, which add an extra level of challenge with their new affixes and resistances. And this is when you're gonna start seeing sacred and unique items dropping. So sacred items are just like higher item level versions of everything below legendary. Whereas the unique items are altogether different. Uh, these will drop with set in stone stat types and affixes, which will just change depending on the item level that they drop at. And some of these uniques come with really cool abilities. For example, I found the Ice Heart Pants, which made it so that enemies who died while frozen would have up to a 20% chance to unleash a new Frost Nova, which would then basically just chain freeze everything. As I was blowing up groups of enemies, I, I Frost Nova them, I blow them up, and then ones that die have a pretty good chance to blow up into another Frost Nova, and it just keeps happening. It's really, really cool stuff. So uh, yeah, anyways, World Tier 3, better loot starts dropping, more interesting loot starts dropping, there's harder enemies to fight and you've got more things to do and it was really at this point that I felt like the game started to open up and the combat was getting a lot more engaging because it was more difficult because there were new activities and all of that. One of those activities being the hell tides. So hell tides rotate on and off every other hour. This basically takes over two large regions in one of the game's five main zones. These entire areas turn red essentially like with hellfire raining from the sky. This is an actual mechanic. Sometimes you'll have to dodge it as it falls down and then enemies within the hell tide drop this resource called cinders. So basically you just go into the hell tide, farm groups of enemies, do events and kill bosses, which these areas do have these unique roaming hell tide specific bosses. All of this gives you cinders. You gather up as much as possible within the hour that's available. And then you take those cinders to these chests located all around the hell tide. And there will be different types of chests for weapons, for armor, for rings and amulets. So you turn your cinders in, you get a random drop of the type that's listed on the chest you'll know ahead of time if it's like a two-handed weapon, if it's a helm, if they're pants, if it's a ring or amulet. You'll see what the chests are. You turn in however many cinders you collected that are required for that chest and you get a random drop. And these do seem to have a very high likelihood of dropping legendary or higher items. On multiple occasions, I would actually get several sacred pieces from a single chest, which was really good. And it seems like hell tides are great if you are looking for specific legendary or sacred aspects for your particular build as it lets you turn in exactly Exactly for the type of gear that you're looking for. You just have to find the right chest within the Helltide. Uh, and sometimes if you are really lucky, an area can be both within a Helltide and also have Tree of Whisper quests located in there at the same time, in which case you're just getting like a ton of value from farming in that particular area. Great opportunity when those things sync up to farm a bunch of gear. It's really cool. Really cool. And next up are the Nightmare Dungeons. And this is really like the bread and butter of Diablo 4's endgame. It is the one main activity that has an ever increasing difficulty as you continuously unlock higher and higher sigils, which are basically like keys that open up the nightmare dungeons. And these higher levels push enemy monster levels higher and higher above the max character level of 100. This is 
the progressive difficulty thing that you'll be working on as you continue leveling, gearing up, and powering up. You're just trying to push higher level nightmare dungeons. That's like the main goal, basically. So how does it work? Well, it's pretty simple. You will start off getting random low level sigils. You'll just get them as you play after you progress into world tier three. And this will grant you access to a nightmare version of one particular dungeon in the game. So the nightmare variants will add a bunch of modifiers, changing things up a bit. There's going to be some sort of buff for your character, like it sometimes it'll increase a certain type of damage or increase your attack speed. It'll increase your resistances, making you more tanky. But then also there are going to be more enhancements for the enemies, making them tougher, making them deal more damage, even in a lot of cases, making them explode when they die or leave pools of damage on the ground. But the most interesting thing is that these will also sometimes add an additional dungeon mechanic. So this includes something like the drifting shade, where you'll get this little shade that chases the player exploding when it reaches them. Them, this will deal damage, but then also create a field on the ground that dazes if you walk into it. Or there's this rock pillar that will follow closely behind you the entire time, pulsating damage whenever it gets close. Sometimes there are ones that will have lightning strikes periodically come down, and you have to get under this floating artifact in order to prevent the damage. Or there are ones that will have portals open up and constantly streaming in new monsters. The main point of doing these nightmare dungeons is to, beyond dropping loot at the end of them, to upgrade the glyphs for your Paragon board, which brings us to the Paragon board. Upon reaching level 50, you stop gaining new skill points and start progressing the Paragon board. So for every level, you unlock four new Paragon points to spend on your board. This board is basically an additional layer of character power progression outside of gear. So you begin with your class's starter board. This is set, locked in place, and you start at the bottom and you work your way up. There will be a bunch of normal nodes that will add minimal increases to things like strength, intelligence, willpower or dexterity then also magic nodes that provide stronger boost to various different stat types there are then rare nodes that provide even more powerful boost and legendary nodes and these basically act like additional pieces of gear as they reward what amounts to something equivalent to a legendary aspect and then also dotted all throughout these boards are these empty glyph slots you're gonna play glyphs are gonna drop and these things provide pretty big modifiers and enhancements basically to any of the nodes within the range of the glyph. So depending on the glyphs that you have, you'll have different glyphs that do different things. And if you find ones that are good for your build, you'll slot them into one of the empty glyph nodes on the Paragon board, and they're going to provide a really good boost to all of the nodes that surround them. And these are really strong enhancements. Uh, as mentioned, they can be further powered up by running those nightmare dungeons. So once you get a glyph that you really like, and that's good for your build, odds are, you're gonna to wanna to spend some time farming the Nightmare Dungeons specifically to level up the Glyph. In a lot of ways, it's pretty similar to what running Rifts was in Diablo 3, which you were doing to level up gems. You're running Nightmare Dungeons in Diablo 4 to level up Paragon Glyphs. All right, uh, so a couple more end game things we're gonna to touch on. First up, the world bosses. If you fought the world boss in Diablo 4's open beta, you know exactly what to expect with these. The boss will periodically spawn into the game. You're gonna get a 30 minute warning before they show up. You go to the area, fight the boss and collect the loot. So in the open beta, we fought Ashava the Pestilent. Uh, in the review build, I fought Ashava the Pestilent. And that was it. Uh, in all my time playing, I actually saw the world boss spawn three times. And every time, because I was unlucky, it was Ashava. Now, at the very least, there was some variety here for me because Ashava was located in other spawn locations. There will be set essentially boss arenas located around the map. So I fought Ashava, not in the Fractured Peaks at least, but I just kept fighting Ashava. I didn't see anyone else. Fortunately, Liam was playing as well and fought the other bosses. So we know what they do. First up, there's Avarice the Gold Curse. He's got various melee attacks, slams, and AoEs. Uh, he would stomp on the ground and puke, which you would have to dodge. Occasionally then he would teleport away and slam in when he teleports back into the arena. And then also he would form up these statues that occasionally would burst into these golden AoE pools. This boss was actually pretty straightforward and seems to be the least interesting of the world bosses in the game. And then there was Wandering Death. When he shows up, he's got this sound wave attack in which he would uh, push it out and then summon it back towards him, damaging anything in this path 
would also summon up these large tornadoes that would spin around the arena. He had this charge up beam attack, which he would shoot out of both hands while spinning around. This was really cool looking, honestly. All of this just got progressively more intense to the point where eventually the boss was shooting out three of those beam attacks, which I thought was really cool looking. And that is actually it. Ashava, Avarice, and Wandering Death, as far as we know, are the only three world bosses that are in the game at release. So this is a bit of a disappointment here. One of the handful of disappointments I have with Diablo 4. I'll also say I was hoping that the other world bosses would have some more interesting mechanics, but everything seems pretty straightforward. Liam was able to solo the two additional bosses. None of these bosses seemed particularly challenging. It seems like the hardest part about these world boss fights will just be you dealing with the other players in your instance, scaling up the health of the boss, and if they don't carry their weight, uh, that's going to be a bit of a pain. All right, and the final big end game activity are the fields of hatred, or basically the PvP zones in Diablo 4. There are two of them in the game, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm a little disappointed because they are relatively small. The basic mechanic is really straightforward. There are these two fields of hatred. You go there, killing enemies or bosses or doing events in the region will drop these shards. You collect the shards and then there are basically these extraction points. There's like three or four of them in each one of the PvP zones. They're located on the corners of the map. You go to the extraction point, dump your shards, and then after some 45 second timer, the shards turn into red dust and then you're able to use that red dust as a currency for vendors that sell cosmetics and gear. There's like a gambling vendor version of the PvP currency. So that's the basic system. And then of course, PvP happens within here. Unfortunately, during the review build, there wasn't a lot of PvP that took place. So I am reserving final judgment. I mean, obviously the fact that I didn't actually get to experience PvP took away from the experience, but I'm also just surprised by how really small these zones are. It just feels like they might get really boring because they are just such pretty tiny arenas. They're very tiny spots, but whatever. I'm reserving final judgment until full release when ideally we get to see these things in full swing with tons of other people and everyone's getting one shot, right? With all that said, here is the basic end game loop and what you're doing and why. You're going to probably want to do the world boss and that gathering legion big open world event whenever they happen to pop up. You should also most likely do hell tides whenever they pop up if you are looking to farm specific slots, legendary aspects, or trying to get sacred items in those particular slots. Hell tides are great for that. You will be fairly regularly wanting to farm nightmare dungeons in order to level up those glyphs for your paragon board. And you're going to want to do tree of whispers if you're looking to level up because they're great for experience as well as filling specific low item level gear slots. And you'll do PVP probably just for the fun of it. And that is the loop that I found myself doing. I would, when I felt like leveling up, I would do tree of whispers. Or if I just wanted to explore and fill up empty uh, low level gear slots, I would do tree of whispers. Whenever I saw the world ball boss or gathering legion, I would go do that. When Helltide was up, I would go do that. And I would just then when Helltide or the world boss slash legion event wasn't up, I would rotate between tree of whisper farming, nightmare dungeon farming, and going into the PVP zone. And as I just said, seeing nobody, unfortunately. Uh, so one big omission from the review build was the shop. They didn't have the shop in the game, but they did send us press kit that had screenshots as well as some B-roll of what the shop will look like with what they are saying is the exact prices they plan to launch the shop with. So how does it look? Well, the premium paid currency that you can buy ranges from costing up to $2 to up to $100. From $2 to $10, every $1 equals 100 currency. And then once you reach that $25 bundle, that's when they start adding those bonus free currencies in addition to the $2,500 that you would have got otherwise. And the point of this, of course, is to try to incentivize you to pony up to spend for that $100 bundle as that is the one that gives the greatest amount of free currency or the best value as it is often called in these cash shops. So the cosmetics that we saw ranged in price from $13 for this dress to kill rogue set all the way up to $28 for the Wraith Lord Necro set and $28 appears to be the highest most expensive cosmetic set that I saw in at least what they showed us. And there's everything in between a mix of variety of combinations with different cosmetic slots. Some of them will even include things like emotes and markings for your character. And then there was also this thing called an add-on that you could purchase. One that we saw was the Crypt Hunter add-on, which would give you a mount skin, a couple of cosmetics, and then 800 platinum, and that cost $20. So, I mean, looking at this, it's pretty much everything that I expected. It's like a regular old cash shop. It doesn't really seem all that surprising. We knew this was going to be in the game. It's, you know... <sighs> Seeing $28 bundles in a game that's $70 at its cheapest and one that's also going to be selling a season pass in uh, mid-July, so like a month and a half after release, 
it's a lot of layers of uh, monetization, but you know, we knew this was coming. This part of the game is not at all surprising. So that is a recap of the game and the systems. I do want to touch on some of the early dislikes and concerns that we had from playing the review build. While I do think some of the boss fights are really interesting, they're also incredibly easy. We really didn't see anything that was all that challenging. It seems like the most challenging, most difficult encounter in this game is going to be that pinnacle level 100 boss, but the capstone dungeon bosses weren't all that difficult. The campaign bosses weren't all that difficult. The world bosses aren't all that difficult. And that is all really disappointing. I also feel like some of these counters, while they were interesting, they didn't feel all that unique or, or inspired really. And I felt like playing a game like Lost Ark, I, I faced encounters and boss fights that had much more interesting and fresher takes on ARPG boss fight encounters. A lot of the boss fights in this game just kind of felt like variations of the bosses that I fought in Diablo 3, and I feel like that is a bit of a shame. I feel like Blizzard should have taken more risks, and that's probably one of my biggest critiques about Diablo 4 in general. I really like the core of what is here. It is super competent, it is fun to play, and I plan to play it, but I feel like they played it very, very, very safe, and they didn't take a lot of chances when it comes to mechanics and systems within the game. They just built a good feeling ARPG. They made it open world and MMO light shared world, which I love both of those things, but it doesn't feel like it's really pushing the boundaries outside of that structure that they've built here. Uh, some of the content in the game with things like the strongholds and the campaign bosses, they don't have ways to replay them really. Like they don't reset making them repeatable, which is a shame because they are some of the cooler things in the game. I would love an opportunity to replay strongholds and fight campaign bosses again because both of those things are enjoyable to engage with, but we only get to do them one time around. Feels like the scaling is a bit wonky. A lot of people kind of complained about this a bit in the betas, but it's true for release as well. You'll basically fluctuate between things being incredibly hard but way too easy all depending on the gear that drops maybe that's just working as intended because this is a loot game but the the scaling and the difficulty of things does not feel consistent and smooth it feels like you hit these hard walls and then all of a sudden everything's way too easy and that kind of yo-yos back and forth while you play speaking of which tier four levels out a ton and once you get good gear it is no longer difficult and it really doesn't take that long tier four as a reminder is the highest tier difficulty you get to tier four and you hit this point where you gear up and everything is just easy and then basically the rest of the game for the rest of the time is really easy at that point with the only exception and it's still good at least that this is here is those nightmare dungeons because as I mentioned you will just keep getting higher and higher level keys that keep pushing the monster levels higher and making things more challenging and that is the uh, ever progressing difficult. It's not infinite progressing, but it is ever progressing up to a point because eventually you'll hit level 100, you'll get all your best gear slots, you'll get your best rolls, and then even those max level nightmare dungeons aren't going to feel that hard at that point. At least that is my assumption. Class balance still feels out of whack here, and I'm not talking specifically about end game balance, but while leveling up, and while this doesn't really matter in the long run, it's pretty stark difference when you start off playing something like, say, the rogue or the sorceress in my example and then you try switching to level up a Barbarian or a Druid, both of those classes just feel terrible to start. Now, the good news apparently is that they get really strong in the end game, but it would be nice if they didn't feel so underpowered in the leveling process. So now after going over everything, talking about Diablo 4 content, talking about my experience in the review build, what I liked, what I didn't like, how long do I think I will be playing Diablo 4? Well, my guess is it's probably gonna take about two to three weeks before I am geared and leveled up enough to clear the hardest content in the game, which is moving through those nightmare dungeons that will scale up, right? And then eventually taking on that level 100 boss itself, which is what Blizzard has said is basically the pinnacle PVE challenge in the game at the moment. Now there is of course a never ending amount of loot that we can grind for as you search for perfect rolls and the highest end range values for various attributes and affixes on every piece of gear. But for me, typically once I am geared to the point where I can clear the hardest or close to hardest content in these games, I'm pretty much satisfied with what I've seen. So yeah, my guess is that's gonna be in the vicinity of two to three weeks, maybe up to four, depending on my daily playtime. After which, you know, we could extend the amount of playtime if I'm screwing around with friends in PvP, or if I decide to level up a, a new character, which then would add another two to four weeks to my playtime, at which point we'll be nearing the start of season one, which that there you go, that should line up perfectly. And we'll play through season one and we'll see how long I continue to maintain interest there. A lot of that is gonna hinge on how much they mix up this core experience, because yeah, the core experience, 
I'm probably looking at about four to six weeks uh, before I feel like I've kind of run through everything and I'm pretty satisfied with where I'm at. That said, as mentioned earlier, a majority of Diablo 4's long-term success is gonna hinge greatly on how substantial and how interesting that seasonal content ends up being. What I can tell you is that while I do think there's room for improvement here and I would have liked to see Blizzard take some bigger swings and try some more innovative stuff, all told, the core of Diablo 4 it's a lot of fun. I really enjoyed playing through it and I am pumped to dive in this week and play the game with everyone else. I do have some critiques, but ultimately the worst part about playing the review build last week is when the servers went offline because I just wanted to keep on playing. And for me, that is a telltale sign that I enjoy a game. That's gonna do it for me today. Thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed the vid. I'll see you next time.